good to see you all. It's good to see some new faces here, some faces underneath, underneath some face masks. Uh, good morning, everybody at home, logging on. Hope you're doing well. What a beautiful spring morning, hey? I mean, spring has sprung. We're almost there, but spring has sprung. Well, as Tony mentioned, we're talking about some kind of intense things this morning. We're talking about spiritual warfare, spiritual battles, spiritual struggles, intense stuff to be talking about on a beautiful Sunday morning. I tell you what, I think we need to pray. We need to pray right now that not that God would be with us, we know he's with us, but that his tangible presence would be felt here as we speak about these really important things and that we wouldn't just hear them and then kind of go away unchanged, but actually God would do his work. I mean, isn't that why we're here? We want to grow, we want to change, we want God to be made real to our hearts today. So can we pray for that? Let's do that together. Lord, I just want to echo all those things that we've said. We're here because we want to see people, we want some sense of community, but ultimately we want to grow in our faith. We want to be aware of the truth of what is actually going on in the spiritual realms, in life. In order to do that, we need to hear from your word, timeless truths in a timely manner. Speak through me, a broken vessel. Speak through me to speak to your people who you love. Encourage us and challenge us today and meet us by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, a little while ago, I was reading the kids' Bible with one of my kids. We try and do that every night or as much as we can. And a little while ago, we're reading one of the versions of the kids' Bible, and we got to the end, focusing on Revelation. And you're kind of thinking, oh, how are they going to deal with this, right, in the kids' Bible? And I remember turning the page and sort of chuckling to myself, because as we know, the, the book Revelation was written by the Apostle John while he was in exile on a, the Greek island of Patmos. Now, of course, in kids' Bibles, they're illustrated beautifully, right? They've got lots of pictures. So this particular picture had the Apostle John on the island of Patmos reclining on a deck chair, you know, arms behind him, you know, kind of like he was in a holiday resort. And I chuckled to myself, the kids, what are you laughing at? Don't worry about it. It's probably above your pay grade of understanding. But I just kind of laughed to myself. Now, I don't want to bag kids' Bibles. They're awesome. I think they're almost always amazing, and they do a great job of trying to translate the Bible to kids. It's not easy. Make it relevant to them, right? It's not an easy task. And I love the use of, be- of pictures and beauty, all that kind of stuff. It's great. So I'm not bagging that at all. But it, it got me thinking about a kind of a big question. How do we view the Christian life? I mean, how many of us view it a little bit like John on a deck chair on the island of Patmos. It wasn't Abitha, it was, a Pat, it was on Patmos. He was in exile, he was being persecuted. That wasn't his experience at all. But what's our view of the Christian life? Let me ask you, what is your expectation of life? Aren't expectations kind of everything? You know, all disappointment is an unmet expectation. I think that's totally true, actually. What is your expectation of life? What's your expectation of the Christian life? What image best describes it for you? A cruise ship or a battlefield? Now, cruise ships are a bit tainted in corona times, right? No one wants to want to be on a cruise ship, do they? Maybe that looks more like a battlefield. But you know what I mean, right? Cruise ship, resort living, a holiday. Is that more your expectation of life, of the Christian life? Resort living or fighting it out in the trenches? You know, you can tell a lot about what people think by what we complain about. I reckon that's a good giveaway. I find that in myself. You know, if you think life should be kind of resort living, easygoing, holiday vibe, I think you'll find yourself complaining about kind of minor things, small things. Why? Because your world is quite small, because it's about the pursuit of pleasure, the avoidance of pain. That's what it's about. And so... Your world will be smaller, so you'll find yourself whinging about small things like guilty as charged, traffic, long lines, that's a favorite, 
long lines in the buffet on the cruise ship, right? That, that kind of thing. Waiting 10 days for your Amazon order to arrive. Oh, how hard is that? Or, you know, the waitress forgot your side of aioli that you clearly ordered when you put your order in. They're the things you whinge about. Now, of course, I'm, I'm kind of joking tongue-in-cheek, but you know what I mean. You feel that if they're the things you grumble about, it's quite telling. And what about people on the other end of the spectrum? What about people living in wartime, actually living in trenches? Now, what are they whinging about? Comfortable beds, hot meals, man, they are a gift. They're so rare. People in trenches and in war, with a wartime mentality, they don't whinge about, my steak is more medium than medium rare. Right? They don't, they're not the things they complain about. What do you complain about? Man, I'm running out of ammo. What's stopping me fighting effectively? What's stopping me achieving my mission? I don't have enough men. My supply lines are running short. There's a hole in defences. I'm running out of ammo. Well, that's pretty telling if you're complaining about that, right? Now, we're in our series called Knowing Who You Are. We're still there. There we go. We're taking eight weeks to look at eight images in the New Testament that help us kind of get a bit of a picture of what's our Christian identity. Well, it's a little bit like being a... Pilgrim, we looked at that. Citizen, we've looked at athlete, steward, farmer. Today we're looking at soldier. All these images just shed light a bit more about what it's like being a Christian. Being a Christian is a little bit like being a soldier. They may not have thought that before. Really? A soldier? If you've been in the church for a little while, you might have sung Onward Christian soldiers. Has anyone sung that at the church? Anyone know? Yeah, okay. onward Christian soldiers. What are they doing? Marching off to war. What an intense thing to sing about, right? Really? Okay. If so, how? Being a Christian is a little about being a, being a soldier. How? Well, I think these three things are going to help us navigate this today. Firstly, we're going to do a bit of a reality check. We're going to realize we're in a war. Just really positive stuff we're talking about this morning. We're gonna, we're, come on, but we need a reality check. We're going to realize we're at war. And then we're going to look at two questions. Okay, if that's true, what or who are we fighting? And how do we fight? So that's where we're going this morning. Are you excited? Oh, I can tell. You're just, you're just jazzed. I'm excited. You're going to see me get really excited later on. Oh, yeah. All right, so we're going to get going. We, first thing, we're going to have a reality check. We're going to realize that we're at war. Now, I don't know where you're all at on this topic of spiritual warfare. You might be thinking, what am I doing here this morning? These guys are crazy. Spiritual warfare? Spiritual battles? Maybe it's totally new for you. Maybe you thought about this a lot. I don't know. Fact is, we are engaged in a war, a battle, a struggle. Paul says it, right? Verse 12 of our reading that was read so well by Rob and Ann, for our struggle... You hit struggle, battle. Struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We're in a spiritual battle. It's, it's not a, a physical one, okay? It's, although you'd be forgiven if you looked online, on Facebook, and saw all the Christians warring at each other. Oh, my goodness. You know, that's, no, that's not what we're talking. That's not a spiritual battle, okay? That's not the battle we're in. We're in a spiritual battle. So it's harder to see the enemy. But nevertheless, we are in a spiritual battle. Paul makes his point really clear. I could rattle off lots of verses. But I love these ones where Paul, the mentor, is speaking to the mentee in Timothy. Now, what does he say? Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well. Okay. Elsewhere, he says to Timothy, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And one of my favorites, a friend of mine, has it tattooed really big on his arm. What does he say? To Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Okay, are you with me? We are in a battle, a wrestle, a struggle. Okay, Dave, so what? Why does it matter? Why is it important? Think about it. If you were at war, wouldn't you want to know? Wouldn't you? I mean, if you were in a real war, you'd know about it. But if you're in a spiritual war, wouldn't you want to know the lay of the land? Okay, well, really? who's the enemy then? Where are they? How do I fight them? You'd want to know, right? 
I mean, think about it. I, I, I like war movies. You know, I don't know if you like them, but I think, I mean, they can be a bit bloody and gory sometimes, but, but there's something intense about them. The characters are good, the friendships that are formed in the trenches. You know, they're just some amazing films and series. Particularly, I love Saving Private Ryan. Who doesn't love that film? If you've seen it, that opening scene is so intense. I mean, it depicts the D-Day landings. Now, we're going to talk about that later on, but... The, the, the invasion of mainland U Europe, which was held so strongly by the Nazis. And the first, I don't know how long it is, 20-minute scene or whatever it is of saving private right is so intense. All of these soldiers come onto the beach to try and take this, this well-fortified beachhead. And you've got machine gun firing everywhere. You've got these soldiers, right? They are trained. They're trained well. They, they've got training and they know what they're there to do. And they're being taken out. Machine gun fire going everywhere, mortars going off, mines exploding, and they're being taken out. Now, imagine this. Imagine if you walked on that scene in flip-flops, Hawaiian shirt and board shorts. Imagine that. How long do you think you'd last? Not very long, would you? It's comical. You'd be, you'd be a goner in seconds. You would not last very long. I think some of us are a little bit like that. When we've got no idea that we're in a spiritual battle, we just get taken out. We often get fooled into thinking we're not at war. And if that's true, we've already lost because we're not prepared. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. And in wartime, everything changes. Everything changes. Now, let me ask you a question. What would it take? What would it take for us to change our perception of reality from sort of cruise, cruise ship resort living life to, man, all right, I'm in a battle. What would it take to change our thinking? When I was living in the States, I got to visit, excuse me, got to visit um, the Queen Mary. I don't know if you guys know much about this. I didn't know much about it. It's this huge old school luxury liner that is permanently in harbor in Long Beach, California. It's awesome. And it's quite famous because it had two histories. You might know this. I didn't really know it until recently. It had two histories. It was built as the luxury liner, you know, the playtime for the rich and famous. But then during the Second World War, it was totally changed to be troop, tra excuse me, troop transport. So it has these two lives. And now it's a museum. You can go on board the ship and see its two lives. It's quite fascinating. And it's just it's a little partition separates the two eras. So on one side of the partition, you've got this dining room. I mean, you just picture this dining room of the rich and famous, right? It, how many knives and forks it takes to eat a meal, I don't know, but there they all are, right? All the different plates and cups. There's 15 different plates and sauces, 15, right? All of these wine glasses set up for all different tastings, and the table arrangements are enormous. You can imagine it. Can you picture it? It's beautiful. Then on the other side of the partition, it could not be more different. One metal tray with indentations, a fork and a mug replaces everything on the other side. Couldn't be more different. You go into the bedrooms and there's this palatial bedroom for a couple or a single person. On the other side, bunks all the way around, eight bunks high. You imagine being on that top bunk of eight. Whew, that's pretty high on a ship. My goodness. So different. Amazing. Now, what did it take for a thing of luxury and beauty to be transformed into something so utilitarian? What did it take? It took a national emergency, didn't it? It took the war. It took a tragedy. I mean, Pearl Harbor, right? It took the, the leaders of that nation saying, if we don't change, we're done for. It took an emergency. See the situation for what it was, really serious. Now, here's the thing. What would it take to change our lives? I'm asking you, what would it take for you to change our lives from thinking this life, you know, your expectations of it is, yeah, it should be as, as happy and go lucky and free and, and good. As, what's it going to take to change that? Maybe you've experienced tragedy already and difficult times. You know, Dave, I know what you're talking about. Life is a battle. It's hard. What's it going to take for us to convince us we're at war? What's it going to take to wake us up from our spiritual slumber? Because when we are awakened, it changes everything. 
When, we, when you're in wartime, everything changes. I mean, the way you eat, it's all rationed, right? You can't just go to a restaurant. Everything changes. When we realize, when you have a well, wartime mentality, that you cannot look at anything the same anymore. Let me give you, I could give you so many examples. Let me just say this. I've written about three or four sermons worth of material. Don't worry, you're only getting one this morning. There is so much to say here. So much to say. We should be doing a series on this in staff meeting we're talking about. We should be doing a series on spiritual warfare. So I kind of feel like I'm gliding over this and I'm doing a disservice to all of it. So I apologize if it's fast and we're not going deep. But there's so much to say. So many examples I could give on this particular issue. But I just want to talk about this one now. Marriage. Let's talk about this for a moment, right? Marriage. It's a battle. Now, some of us might laugh, right? Because, yeah, it, it is it is a struggle. But the different way we approach our marriages by having a holiday resort living, it should go, it should be easy. And then, no, 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 this is going to be tough. Drastically different outcomes. Drastically different. With a battlefield mentality, we stop becoming passive victims of circumstances and we get on the front foot and we fight for our marriages. We don't fight in our marriages, we fight for our marriages. Now, I understand not everyone is married here. And some of us have been, some of us want to be. I, I understand that. But everyone knows someone who is married. And I think marriages particularly have a target on their back. See, if we don't understand this, we won't even realize that we are being taken out. We won't understand what, why is it so hard. It should be easy. Who told you that? We won't understand that it is hard. We won't understand why sometimes we, we want to check out. We won't understand that, you know, sometimes I want to give up. I don't know if you've seen a Christian movie. It's called Fireproof, about 10 or so years old. It's a bit cheesy, but it's good, man. Just get through the cheesiness and watch it. You'll be encouraged. There's a great song in it. It's called Love is Not a Fight by Warren Barfield. It's a great song. And it ends with, love is not a fight, but it's something worth fighting for. Oh, every time I kind of listen to that chorus, I just I tear up because them fighting words. Yes. Yeah, we've got to fight for our marriages. Absolutely. So in thinking about our marriages, the question becomes not, how can I just get through this? <laughs> you know, How can I avoid this difficult conversation? I mean, particularly for us who are conflict avoiders, how can we just you know, get through it? How can I avoid that conversation? How can I just take the easy path? Let's face it, that's our natural inclination with so many things. The question doesn't become, how can I make it easier? The question becomes, how can we shore up, strengthen the foundation of our marriage so that when the mortar comes and explodes nearby, it shakes us, but we're not destroyed? Because that's going to happen. The attack will come. What are we doing to strengthen those relationships. Now, we can apply this to anything, relationship to our kids, to our, to our friends. I mean, think of friendships, absolutely talk about this. What about our very faith? How am I strengthening my faith? So when the attack comes, I can stand. What are we doing about it? We need to be awakened from our spiritual slumber. You getting pumped up? Good. Woo. All right. So, that's the first point. The others are quicker. Don't worry. So, okay, we're at war. Oh, by the way, I did that the other day. There's a photo of the Queen Mary in its heyday. Aren't you just thankful you saw that? Okay, we're going to keep moving. Realize you're at war. All right, Dave, I get it. Here I am. Who or what are we fighting? We are fighting the unholy trinity. Ready? The world, the flesh, and the devil. We're going to go through them really quickly. Here we go. The world. What do you mean I'm at war with the world? In Scripture, the world represents the collective humanity setting itself against God. I think the Tower of Babel is a good example. We will make a name for ourselves. Forget God. We don't need Him. 1 John says this. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. The world is all of our anti-God natural dispositions brought together in a big get-stuffed for God. 
The world will communicate to us a certain way of living, at the very least, minimizes God. Now, I'm not saying the world's all out to get you. You know, it's us versus them. We'll talk about that in a second. But no, I don't think that's the case. But the world's not going to encourage you in your faith. They might say, oh, yeah, a bit of spirituality. Spirituality, yeah, tack that onto your life. But wholehearted commitment to Christ, I don't think so. The world's not going to help you follow Jesus. It's going to take you away from dependence on God, of course. Now, I think it's important to make a quick side note here. I'm not a big fan of the us versus them. You know, let's just kind of circle the wagons. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. Let's just kind of, it's the Christians. Let's get them together. The world's gone crazy. I actually, I don't believe in that. I believe in the doctrine of common grace. There's good out there in the world. It's God's good world. There are things in our culture and in the world that we can affirm. Justice. Serving the poor, the vulnerable. Care for the environment. Respecting government. These are things People not part of the church, unbelievers, are passionate about. We can partner with them in bringing those kingdom values. Where do you think those values came from? They've come from God. We can partner with those people in bringing those kingdom values to earth and introduce them to the author of those things. Okay, so it's not all just us and them. But still, of course, there are going to be things that we challenge, that the world will think we're crazy for standing up for. And when we do, we will be persecuted. Absolutely. And even when we're not doing that, people will come against us. What did Jesus say? They hated me, they're going to hate you. In this world, you will have trouble. It's a promise. (laughs) But take heart, I've overcome the world. Okay, so who are we fighting? The world. We don't go looking for a fight with the world. It's not like that. But we be on our guard. Okay, so who else? Fighting the world. The flesh. What does that mean? The battle we fight is also an internal battle that takes place in the heart of every believer. Our natural inclination, like I've already said, is to live apart from God. That's the very definition of sin. Don't need you, thanks, I'm fine. Our hearts are prone to wander, as the famous hymn says, even after we become Christians. Now, yes, absolutely, when we become Christians, we've got a new master. We cannot be mastered by sin anymore. Big difference. But we're still going to struggle. There is a reason I sometimes don't want to open my Bible. I'll be honest with you. I just think, ah, there's part of me that says, you don't need him today. You don't need to bow the knee. You're okay on your own. There's a reason that happens. Until the resurrection, believers will struggle with mixed passions. I wish it wasn't so. I wish I could tell you. It's not going to be that way, but I think until we get to the grave, until we are raised again, we're going to struggle. Paul says it, Galatians 5, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh, that that means the the sinful part of us, leftover part of us, right? For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh, they are in conflict with each other. It's an internal struggle too. The battle is between our own fleshy desires and the Spirit of God. God invites us to walk with Him and we live in step with Him. When we do, the result's obvious. What? The fruit of the Spirit. And when we don't, the result is equally as obvious. Okay. We're at war. Who are we fighting? Well, the world. We've got to be on defensive against the world, not wholeheartedly embrace everything apart from the, of the world. We're also fighting the flesh. What else? The devil. Really, Dave? We're talking about the devil? Now, I don't know where you are at with this whole devil thing. You might even think, ah, is it real? I don't have have time to say everything about who the evil one is. But let me just say, if Jesus believed the devil was real, the personification of evil is good enough for me. Let me just say this quickly. What am I going to say? I'm not sure. <laughs> you might think you know, you've got this sort of cartoon version of the devil in your mind, like red, goatee, pitchfork, horns, that kind of thing. Let me just say this. He is real, he's your enemy, and he's got a plan against you. He is real. If you're a Christian, he's your sworn enemy, and he has a plan. Ephesians 6.11 
Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. He's a schemer. He's also known as the father of lies. All he can do is lie. He's a schemer and he plans our downfall. Okay, bear with me here. Picture this. Wherever the devil resides, hell, where he is, think of a room full of filing cabinets. In one of those filing cabinets, in one of those sections, is a file with your name on it, on the top. In it is a plan. That's the evil one's plan to bring you down. What do you think when you hear that? It's confronting, isn't it? Remember the first time I heard that illustration, I was very confronted. He has a plan to bring you down. Let me ask you, what's in that file? I reckon you've got a sneaking suspicion. I do. I think I know what's in there. If the devil were to take me out of ministry, if the devil were to ruin my marriage, if the devil were to ruin my relationship with my kids, what would he have to do? I think I know. I know my weaknesses. I know my struggles. He'd expose them, wouldn't he? Temptation, lies, doubt. We'll get to that in a second. What's in your file? I reckon we know. The devil's aim is to take us away from the truth, to veil it, conceal it, take us away from Christ. That's what he wants to do. He wants to derail our loyalty to Christ by coercing us into disobedience. He'll use whatever means necessary to do it, but he's got some favorite tactics. And we see his most favorite at the very beginning. Do you know it? The serpent in the Garden of Eden. Now, what does he say to Eve? What are the first words to come out of his mouth? Did God really say? Did God really say? He sowed the seed of doubt into our first parents, and since that day we have struggled ever since with the same questions. This is the root to all of our struggles, is these doubts. Did God really say, can I really trust him? Does he really have my best intentions at heart? Surely God is holding out on me. Right? You can relate to that? I sure can. Okay, so we're in a war. We've got some enemies. Pretty sobering. We've got some enemies. Keen to bring us down. At the very least, keen to not see us flourish. So what do we do? Fight. How do we fight? How do we fight? Well, we arm ourselves for battle. Ephesians 6. I mean, this is just the best. I'm going to read it in its entirety again because it's so good. And we're almost done. Don't worry. This is our shortest point. Ephesians 6, 10, verse 17. Come with me. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggles, not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So what? Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, it's going to come. It's not if, it's when. You may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with a belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows, darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Whew, they get you fired up? I'm fired up. How do we fight? We arm ourselves. With what? The armor of God. I don't know if you know much about this old school armor, but it's heavy. It takes a long time to put on. I've sort of been in one of those plays where you've got to put it on. It was kind of the real deal. It takes a long time to put on. You could, that would take you a long time to put all of that stuff on. Purposeful, yeah? Deliberate. Putting on the armor of God. Now, I don't have time to go through every one. 
okay, but in detail. But look at the things that help us stand firm. And that's, that's the aim. How much did that passage talk about standing firm and stand firm? That's the aim. And after you've learned to stand, don't give ground, stand. Well, what have we got at our disposal? Truth, righteousness, faith, peace, God's word. So, where do we go from here? Get out there and fight. That's kind of what I feel like. Get out there and fight. Come on. Swing the sword of truth. Put on the armor of God. Use your shield of faith against the stupid lies of the evil one. Extinguish those foolish doubts and questions. Swing that sword. You know, I was thinking about my favorite movies, classic. I'm a classic bloke, Saving Private Ryan, Braveheart and Gladiator. Right there, I'm kind of my favorite movies. And I was just thinking about, oh, maybe I should like have a clip, you know, going as I'm saying this. With like you know Maximus in in you know in the, in the the gladi- gladiator stadium, what's it called Colosseum? You know, as he's wielding the sword, and this is a moment you get pumped up to fight. You know, a brave heart swinging those enormous broadswords. It kind of Jesus up, doesn't it? And I thought about showing a, a film clip to kind of all right. So do likewise. Get out there and fight. And I reckon it would kind of work. Get the juices flowing. Get us you know pumped up for a fight. It'll work. For a little while. Because I I don't know about you, but swinging that broadsword, I reckon I could do it for about three to four minutes. And then I just, oh, I don't have the strength. Maybe Luca or Anders could probably do it for longer. But, you know, I can't swing that sword for long. Man, I get tired swinging that thing. So here's the question. We're all going to end here. Here's the question then. How do we fight the good fight for life? Not just today. Yeah, I'm G'd up. It was a good message. Mediocre good message from Dave. I'm going to, yeah, okay, I'm going to fight. How do we do it for the long haul? Oh, verse 10 is key of this passage. Finally, are you listening? Just listen to this, if nothing else. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Be strong in what? The Lord and whose power? Not yours, his mighty power. This changes everything. This this changes everything. It actually isn't up to us. It's not up to you. Thank goodness. The fate of the world does not depend on you. It does not depend on me. Whew, that's a relief. Fighting in our own strength eventually just leads to exhaustion and despondency. So what do we do? This sounds so counterintuitive, especially to us in this day and age, in this part of the world, in this part of Australia, this part of Sydney. It sounds so counterintuitive, but it's this. You ready? Spiritual power, that's what we're after, is found in resting in Christ. Did I hear you right, Dave? What? Spiritual power is found in resting in Christ. Let me explain that, okay? It just sounds, it's classic Jesus. It's classic Jesus. 180, but spiritual power is resting. The power to fight our spiritual battles doesn't come from exercising our will for behavior modification. It doesn't work. It works for a little while. If that worked, we wouldn't need Jesus, would we? We wouldn't need his grace for change. We just pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, whatever that means. Right? We'd try harder and do better, and then we'd be okay. But that doesn't work. It certainly doesn't work for long. The power to fight our spiritual battles lies in the spiritual victory that Jesus Christ has already won. When we rest in his complete work of what he did for us on the cross, like you are resting in your chairs right now, the weight that you have in your... Oh, the trust, the rest, that's faith. You're, you're resting in the saving work of Jesus Christ. When we rest in that, that gives us power to fight our own battles. The world, the flesh, the devil. Let me explain. I think this is helpful. We can fight our battles because he fought the greatest battles on our behalf and won. He won. This changes the battle of hopelessness into hope-filled battle. Let me try and illustrate it. Going back to Saving Private Ryan, okay? D-Day invasion of Europe. The Nazis and her, the axes of evil, her allies held Europe for years. You couldn't get in. 
They tried paratroopers, they tried different failed attempts. And so their allies, America, Britain, Australia, and other allies, planned for months and months the invasion of Europe, D-Day. They knew it was going to be costly. They knew it was going to be expensive. But they planned it for months and months and months. Finally, the day came in 1944. So many men hit the beaches of Normandy and lost their lives very costly. But finally, victory was won. A beach head was established. That changed everything. They could get supplies and soldiers in to flood the continent of Europe so victory could occur. On that day, right, when D-Day was won, the invasion of Normandy was won, the war was won. That was it. That was the death blow for the Nazis and her allies. That was it. You can look back to that. That was the point of victory. There were other factors, of course, but that was it. Once that was won, victory was a foregone conclusion. But here's the thing. The mopping up operations, what they called it, still had to happen. There was a year more of war to come. Heaps of battles. The famous Battle of the Bulge was still to happen. But the war was already won. Victory was a foregone conclusion. Everything that Germany did from that point on was just a death rattle. And they knew it. Now, what does that mean for us? Jesus fought the greatest battles on your behalf and won. It changes how we fight. Who are our enemies again? Remember? The world. Jesus is stronger than the powers of the world. And because of that, you and I now have access to that power to fight. Scripture says the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Jesus Christ defeated the power of sin. So the fight is winnable against the flesh, right? We're not fighting a hopeless battle. In him we can have victory because he broke the power of sin on the cross. We're going to struggle always, but no longer will we be mastered by sin as people of God. The devil... Jesus defeated the power of the devil in the classic judo move at the cross, using his own weight against him. The devil would have thought stringing up the Son of God on the cross was the greatest victory. How wrong was he? That through death, Jesus would defeat death and defeat the power of the evil one. Now he is leashed. He is but a roaring lion. We resist him and he flees. Because of what you've done, get real. Because of Jesus Christ and the victory he won on the cross. I love Colossians 3. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So good. All right. This changes how we fight. The great war has been won, and we're on the side of victory. I'll close with this. C.S. Lewis, in his great book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I read it recently to Bella, my little girl. It's a great scene at the end with a final battle. If you know anything about it, Aslan is the Christ figure, the great lion. Sort of represents Christ. He has already died on the stone table. He gave his life in place of Edmund, the rebellious kid. He gave his life in his place. That happens. It's very sad. They mourn him. But there's still a battle to fight. And so Peter, Susan, Lucy, and Edmund now fight the forces of the white witch. They've got a battle. And they begin the battle, and they're fighting away. And then the, just the, the pinnacle moment in the, in the battle happens. Aslan appears, having conquered death, and he goes straight for the white witch and defeats her. And you, the, the roar of victory amongst the forces of good is deafening, and it's beautiful. That changes everything. Because now they fight with the one who has conquered death. Man, if Aslan is with us, and he has conquered death. We're going to win this battle. You see what I'm trying to say? Because Jesus has defeated death, what are we going to fear? What can we fear? The world, the flesh, the devil? We don't need to. Of course, we still fight, but it's not a hopeless fight. It's not a hopeless fight. It's a hope-filled fight. We fight into victory. The victory is already won. We fight in his strength and in his mighty power. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let's pray that this will be made real to our hearts this morning. Invite the musicians up as we pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we've said a lot. 
We've spoken a lot about some hard truths, some good things. Lord, we just want to take a moment now for you to apply it to our hearts, Lord. We just, what are you nudging in us this morning? Some of us are, are tired. Some of us are weary, battle weary. And we need to stop fighting in our own strength. We need you, God. We, we just desperately need you. We want our spiritual power is found in resting in Christ. So, Lord, we just, even now, we just, we want to rest in you, your finished work on the cross. We need you, God. We want to rest in you. Lord, some of us feel like we're getting taken out. We are really in the thick of battle, and it's not a hope-filled battle. It feels hopeless. What do we need to hear? We need to know that we're not alone. We all struggle. There are going to be days that we're feeling like we are killing it, and days we feel like we are being killed. On every occasion, we just to be reminded of your grace, which is given freely without limit. Just apply that to us. There's people here who may not even know you. Lord, introduce yourself to them right now. You are the saving one, the redeemer. You fought the battles on our behalf. You did it for us. Lord, what uh, what Lies have we believed from the evil one? What are they? Lies of unforgiveness. Lies about who we are. Lies about our identity. What are they? Bring them to the surface. Expose them for what they are. Lies. And help us to meet them with the truth. God, it's going to be a struggle. We're going to need you. We're going to need each other. I pray, Father, that you would strengthen us today and each, each day for this battle. We'd rest in you for that power. In Jesus' name, amen.